And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars, and welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. There is prophetic power in the Word of God. And, you know, I, I love that. I love the name of our ministry, Power of Prophecy. Not just prophecy, but power. It says in Revelation 2, verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Wow. <laughs> it doesn't go to the dictators. It doesn't go to the Caesars. It doesn't go to kings or presidents or prime ministers or the European Union or some stupid man-made organization. No, it goes to he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. <laughs> you know, God gives power to the humble, to the meek, to those who are willing to say, I obey you, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's the reason why people can't be saved. You see, the, the world today says, I'm going to do what I want. It's, it's like Anton LaVey, head of the Church of Satan. And Aleister Crowley, the great beast, 666 from Great Britain, who said, I will do what I want to do. Whatever I want to do. That, I mean, that, that's one of the principal commandments of Satan. Do as thou wilt. But God said, who will do as I want to do? You know, even John F. Kennedy, he encapsulated it in a, in a sense. He said, Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Well, today they ride on the streets, they demonstrate because they want it their way. They got a president now they don't like, and they say, not my president. Well, <laughs> they have their will, but they, they, they don't want what, what was elected, what was chosen for them. I love that. The power of prophecy. Did you know that, that the book of Revelation, it, it, it says right, right in it that God will give a special blessing to every person that reads the words of that book? That's why I love to do talks on the book of Revelation. <laughs> I guess it means I need a lot of blessings. And God will give a, a, a special blessing to he who readeth and keepeth. The words of this book. What does it mean to keep? Keep them in your heart, in your mind, to know they're true, to latch on to them. And regardless of people who say, oh, that's not true. Oh, that's just symbols. Oh, you can't believe in that. Oh, nobody can understand that. You, you can understand it. You, you, you <laughs> I understand the Bible. And, you know, there are things I read in it. And I say, wait just a minute. I've never read this before. But I, I have, I've read it five, six, sometimes 50 times. But sometimes I missed it. Somehow I missed that one verse. And it makes all the difference in the world. Then I go back and read it in context again. And I say, wow, how did I ever miss that? You see, God takes and gives you only what you can handle at that time. He knows what you can handle. And, and, and so every time you read the Bible, it's a different experience. There's no other book like that. There are, there are none. And you will have power. Those people that want to change the Bible, they're just nuts. They're wackos. Don't listen to them. And those people who give you little homilies and, oh, they read this. I mean, I was listening to one of these guys. I think Joel, what's his name, from Houston. Oh, and a huge... A, a church just packed with people to the rafters. I mean, I don't even think they had rafters. It was so huge in there. 
What's his name, Jerry? Osteen, yeah, yeah, Joel. That's it, Joel Osteen. <laughs> I listened to about three sentences. I've heard this before. Actually, I never heard it before, but I did because every sermon he gives is exactly like the one before. Prosperity. God wants you to have this. God wants you to have that. God, maybe God wants you to get a disease and die. Ooh, no, no. He's never preached that before, but that could happen. Why would God want something like that? Let me tell you why. Sometimes I believe, oh, I know I'm wrong. I'm so I'm wrong so often, but I, I, I really do believe that sometimes I think God loves somebody so much. He just wants that person to be up there with him. What do you think of that? Sometimes somebody has such a beautiful spirit, a lovely heart that God says, you know what? I'm going to save that person from the agony of earth. All of that horror down there, all that satanic stuff, I just like him up here. I want him here with me. I would enjoy his company. And he takes you. And the world says, why did he leave so early? Why was that little girl taken? Why was that young man at that tender age taken? That could be it. God wanted him. Mm. People say, oh, oh, that could be it. That could be it. I don't know, but I suspect so. When I see a beautiful person, beautiful heart taken by God, I say, you know, maybe, maybe they were too good for this country. Maybe they were too good for this terrible planet Earth and all of its wickedness. Maybe God said, I don't, I don't want them to get mired in the mud like everyone does here on Earth. Hmm. He took, he, <laughs> he took one man up, still alive up to heaven. That's in the Old Testament. Well, anyway, let's not talk about God because you know what? God is God and he does what he wants. And I love it. Whatever he wants to do, he can do. I'm not going to question him. I, I, I heard a sermon one time. It changed my life. It was a man who he couldn't speak good. You see, he had a, a problem with his brain. He was very intelligent, but he had a problem with his brain because he had had a motorcycle accident. He was a good Christian, but he, you know, went on a motorcycle and he got injured. And he was lucky to be alive, very fortunate, spent many months recovering in the hospitals, many different operations, and he could barely walk in his, he, he, he spoke you, you thought he was mentally retarded, but he was not. He just had that speech impediment from that injury. And oh, the church was full and listened to this young man. I listened to him very carefully. And you know, the words he said were very simple, but he, he, he basically said, he said this. He said, some people look at me with pity. You don't have to pity me, he says. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm very, very fortunate, he said. I've got God in my heart. I know where I'm headed. No, no, don't feel sorry for me, he said. And he says, and you know, some people ask me, are you mad at God? Are you mad at God for letting this happen to you? And then his voice changed. He said, I'm not mad at God. I'm not mad at God. No, God has given me an opportunity to preach to people, to explain my accent, to, to let you know that I still hold on to God. And God is with me. And, you know, it, it, it so affected me. He said, I'm not mad at God. He said, don't ever, you listen to me, friends. He said, don't ever be mad with God. I've spoken to so many friends myself and they said, I've just got mad at God. I had problems with my children, and they, my children went off into drugs and went off and did these bad things, and I just got mad at God. God, I try to treat, teach my children to be, be Christians, and now they're just off and running with the devil, and I'm just mad at you for letting them. Oh, my goodness. They get mad at God. You can't be mad at God. I want to tell you something, friends. I have never... In all my life, ever, been mad 
at God. And if I get mad at God, I hope he punishes me. Maybe, maybe he, he will, maybe he won't. I don't know. He should punish me. I'm an ingrate. He's given me a life. He's given me a voice. He's, he's given me what, whatever it takes. If I have to walk, if I have to, to live in a, a hut, he gives me, if I have to eat the most horrible things on earth from the shacks, he's given me everything. I'm not mad at God. My daughter died some years ago. And you know, daughters shouldn't die. Dads and moms should die first. But my daughter died of cancer. And she was on her deathbed. And she looked up at me and her mom, Wanda. And she said, I want it known. I'm not mad at God. Wow. I hadn't even talked to her about that. I'm not mad at God. And she smiled. But her life was cut short. She was a beautiful girl. But she said, I'm not disappointed in God. God has decided that I'm to go be with him. She knew she was dying, of course. And she was racked in pain. It was quite a terrible experience for us and for her. But she went to be with Jesus. You see, friends, that's why the talk I'm going to talk to you about today, the, the, the subject I'm going to talk about today, people think that I'm a hater. They think that I don't like a certain type of person. They don't know. They don't know that I have a kind heart. They don't know that I have a soft heart. They don't know that I thank God. I don't blame God for anything. I hold him up in everything. I'm only angry at those people who don't appreciate God, who are his enemies. Whoever makes himself to be God's enemies is an enemy of mine. But even then, I will be kinder to that person than they can imagine. I hold no bitterness nor hatred for any man. Some people call me the worst names. They say I'm a white supremacist. That's crazy. I'm not even going to explain to you that I'm not, except to say that from the time I was a little boy, I, I could not understand racial prejudice. I thought that was nuts. And no one had to tell me that at all. I just looked around and saw, well, it's crazy. Not to like these people because they're black or whatever race they were. That's crazy. You may not like what they do. You may not like the, the, the terrible sins they commit, but you cannot like, not like them just because of the color of their skin. That's crazy. I decided that from the time I was thinking. And as far as the Jews, I don't hate any Jew, but I have a responsibility to you to tell you what their horrible religion of Judaism is all about. Because Jesus himself said it's a religion invented by the devil, the devil, Satan. He said, you're a, your, your father, the serpent. That's what he told the Jews. That's what he said. Did Jesus hate them? No, but he hated their worship of the Satan, of, of the serpent. Now, I don't know why I started this program this way today, but I did. So <laughs> I, I want to talk to you today about my newest book. You know, this is not the biggest book I've done. You know, I've done Codex Magica and Mysterious Monuments and Conspiracy World, huge books. They're about the size of four or five regular books. And I've written, oh, several books about the Jews recently. Holy Serpent of the Jews. It's a fantastic book. Conspiracy of the Six-Pointed Star. Another great book. But this little book, this book is about 100 pages, approximately. It's entitled Feast of the Beast. Again, that's Feast of the Beast. And you know, I'm thinking, 
this may be one of the most, if not the most powerful and, 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 and striking book that I've ever written. Now, I, I wrote this book, and I did a lot of editing, you know, self-editing on it, because I, I wanted it to be just as perfect as I could get it. Maybe it's got a few little things in it. I don't know. I try to do every book. I try to write them and make them perfect. I really do. I even I try to make sure the commas in the right places and the punctuation and <laughs> everything is capitalized right. But this book, I especially took a lot of time on. For a hundred-page book, I took you know incredible amount of time on this book. I mean, I, I came to know this book. Of course, I was the writer for it. I'm the writer for all of my books. I don't have ghost writers. I don't have researchers. I do my own research. I do my own writing. And everything in my books comes from my heart. And I suppose from my head, too. And this book particularly, and I, I, I wrote it on purpose. And it's, it's a book that's, it's really the first book ever in the world written both for Gentiles and Jews. It's the first book in the whole world which fully explains the doctrines of Kabbalistic Judaism pertaining to the events of the last days. So many people have asked me, what, what do the Jews think about the last days? You know, people think they can go to the, the Holy Bible and read the book of Revelation and or Daniel, the book of Daniel, and, and say, oh, that's what the Jews believe. No, no, no. They've got their own books. They've got the Talmud. It's a series of books. And they've got the Kabbalah, another series of books. And frankly, both those books are connected because you read the Talmud, and much of it comes right out of the Kabbalah. They're very interconnected, you see. So this teaches you the last days according to the Jews. But that's not God. No, that's, that's it's not what God says, you see. Because God said that the Jews teach for their religion the, 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 the traditions of men. They don't teach godly things. They teach what other men have taught them. The things that come from the minds of men are what they teach, the traditions. You know, there are many traditions in this world. You can go to Sweden, to Scandinavia, to Norway, to Denmark, and they have traditions there. Why, you can learn the, the religion of, of the, the, the Norwegians, the ancient uh, Vikings. Oh, they had a god too, and they had Odin, and 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 they worshipped the god of thunder, and so forth. They even worshipped a, a form of the mother goddess, and oh, I mean, you 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 can go to Great Britain and study the the, the people of Ireland and of Scotland, and you will read about the, their god who h u who. And about the Druids, and they had the priest, and they had human sacrifice. And you'll study Stonehenge and all those things. And they, they had all these traditions. And these were traditions of men. But you can go here to the United States and study the religions of the Hopi Indians. Or the Incas down in, in, in Central America, or the Aztecs. They... All you go to Egypt and study of the uh, the serpent, the cobra that was worshipped by the, the 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 priestesses and the priest and 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 how the the uh, uh, ancient pharaohs worshipped. They they all had these traditions of men, and the Jews too took up the traditions of men, and these were not the teachings of holy God. You must understand the difference between these horrible traditions. The Jews at, at one time, study this in the book of Amos in the Bible, it will tell you that at one time they worshipped Milcom. And they worshipped Baal, who was the devil. And, and they actually 
they sacrificed their sons and daughters to the fire god, to Baal and to Milcom. Even the mighty wise Solomon married the women of other tribes, other races, and he he went to their religion, and he brought into the 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 the, the, the holy uh, church, you might say, or tabernacle of God, the, the great uh, temple that he had built. He 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 brought in the Asherah poles, sort of like our Indian Native American Indian totem poles. Brought them right into the temple. Oh, oh, now. <laughs> It's interesting that in in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, is a fascinating description of the worship of the the, the traditions of men. Now, the, the everyday Jewish people believe that their high priest and for the house of Israel worship the ancient God, the great I Am of Moses and the other prophets. But Ezekiel says they did not do so. But they secretly worshipped. Well, let me explain to just tell it to you directly. Now think about that. The people went into the temple. They went into the tabernacles and so forth, the holy places. And there they had the priests. And the priests you know, gave them a form of worship, and they went home and they thought they had worshipped God. But after they left, the priests got together and worshipped somebody else. I believe this happens in churches across America. I was recently reading of a a, a, a church. You would think it's an evangelical church down in Louisiana. And the, the men of the church began to worship I guess they worship a form of the devil. But if you visited that church, you would think they're worshiping God. But after the people left, then they would they would meet on weeknights, and and there they would actually worship the devil. And they began to have sex with different women, and and they would have sex with the children, and oh, oh. And then it all came out when the police investigated, and it was just a horrible mess. But the people thought they were worshiping the Jesus Christ. I believe today there are on the worship altars of Episcopal, Lutheran, and even Baptist churches the devil. And the pastors are worshiping the devil and claiming that they're worshiping Jesus. And they disguise it. Now in Ezekiel 8, I'm going to show you how the Jews can actually worship false things. Even the serpent, even the dragon, even Satan himself, and make you believe they're worshiping something good. You say, oh no, they wouldn't fool me. They wouldn't deceive me. Well, let's see what happened in Ezekiel's day. In Ezekiel chapter 8, the prophet describes the vision given him by God of the secret heresies of the elders of the house of Israel. These were the elders. Lifted up from the earth, Ezekiel was brought in the visions of God to Jerusalem and to the gate of the altar of the sanctuary. Son of man, said God, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here? Well, and he brought me to the door of the court, writes the prophet. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. He he couldn't see it from outside. He was brought to the door of the court and he... Everything was okay, but suddenly there was a, a, behold, a hole in the wall. And then he said unto me, dig in the wall. And when Ezekiel had digged in the wall, behold, he saw a door. Ah, the average man wasn't seeing this. This was something God was showing him what was going on behind the scenes. So I went in, said Ezekiel, and behold, every form of creeping things 
and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Oh, they had painted these beautiful murals of these wicked creatures of serpents and scorpions and horrible, creeping, abominable things on the wall round about. And there they were worshiping these horrible creatures. And Ezekiel was commanded by God to dig in the wall. Behold a door in secret chambers. There he saw these unimaginable dark creatures, creeping things painted on the walls. And the 70 men there, the 70 men, the ancients of the house of Israel were there with incense. And they were worshiping those abominable creatures. And Ezekiel was told by God that not only did the ancients of the house of Israel worship these abominations, but they had filled the whole land with violence and provoked God's anger. Filled it with violence, war, battles, death, and provoked God's anger. You see, what what went on in the temple in secret there had really engaged their minds and had they had, it had led to lusts and to war, to deaths. Those are the terrible consequences of this secret worship. Why do you think we have wars in the world today? Why is ISIS killing people? And why is the United States retaliating? And why is the United States paying for ISIS? I recently read that we, we, we brought one of the Muslim men to Cuba, to Guantanamo, and then they finally released him after being a prisoner there. He went over to England, and he was given over $2 million for being a prisoner. He was paid. But then he went over to Iraq, and he recently... <laughs> committed a terror act and killed 45 people, including himself. He blew up himself and 45 other people. Of course, now his relatives have the $2 million that the government of England gave him. Basically, they paid some Muslim evil, horrible creature to blow up 45 innocent people. They paid him over $2 million, the government did. He let, they let him get on a, an airplane and he flew back to, 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 to Iraq and he joined the, the, the terrorist forces there and he ended up killing those people. Filled the land with violence. That's what Britain has done. That's what the United States has done. We read in Ezekiel 9 verse 3 that the glory of the God of Israel was gone. And that every man of these 70 ancients that were worshiping these creeping critters, or whatever you call them, every man was worshiping these things in the chambers of his imagery. In other words, in his own mind. He had an idea of what the, the creatures were to him. He had his own imagination he was using. That's what happens when you don't keep your mind focused on God and on the God of the Bible, but you have your own imagination. You believe you know God. You develop your own God. He's a God that will approve homosexual marriage between a man and a man, right? That's your God. Whatever you want to do, you'll have your God to okay it, won't you? In the chambers of your imagery, the chambers, the houses, the places where you have the image in your own head, that's where your God resides. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible never changes. He still has the same laws he had before. He's old-fashioned. He's ancient. He has the ancient landmarks. That's God. But if you don't believe that, then you have your own God. You're worshiping in the chambers of your own imagery. And they were in Ezekiel's day too. And they are today. I will prove it. I proved it in the pages of this book, Feast of the Beast. I'm Tex Mars. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. I'll be right back after this brief message. Hello again, friends. You know, I want to invite you, just as God chose Ezekiel and gave him a great vision, he told Ezekiel, dig in the wall <laughs> and see what is happening now. 
in the house of Israel. I believe God is asking you, my friends, dig in the wall. Dig in the wall. Look and see. In this book, I've shown you what's behind the wall. I've shown you the rabbinical elders of Israel today, and they're indeed worshiping these creatures, the same creeping things abominable to God that Ezekiel saw. They're worshiping them today. But no one knows. Ask your pastor. They're, they're, they're dumb. They're stupid. They don't want to know. And they say, oh, I don't know about Judaism. They worship God, don't they? No. They don't even, they don't even believe Jesus. Jesus said, no, they don't worship God. You don't have for God. You don't, you don't worship the God of Moses. You worship Satan. He told the Jews that they haven't changed. The Encyclopedia Judaica says the Jews of today, the Orthodox Jews are the Pharisees of Jesus day. And they worship the traditions of men. The chambers of imagery as conceived by men. And today they're worshiping these creeping things. Hmm. How, how, how can anyone worship creeping things? Well, I want to tell you today that I have studied this and God has revealed to me and I've given it to you in this book, the feast of the beast. That beast is the one they worship. His name is Leviathan and they Oh, oh, they, 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 in fact, a great Jewish writer has recently written a book and it's been a bestseller for many years now. It's called The Joy of Leviathan. Oh, they have joy. They, they loved to play with Leviathan. Who is Leviathan? The book of Job will tell you. He's the crooked and the piercing serpent. He's portrayed in the chambers of their imagery in Judaism today. Leviathan. Hmm. We're going to, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. How Job. Yes, Job was, oh, he was, he was, oh, he was so horribly punished by the devil. So many bad things happened to him. Oh, you don't want anything that happened to Job to happen to you. Terrible things happened to him, but he refused to give up God. He said to his friends, well, they were to turn out not to even be friends because they said, you must have done something wrong in your life. Why don't you just curse yourself? Why don't you just curse God and die? Wow. Job wouldn't do that. He would never curse God and die. He wouldn't curse God and live. He wouldn't, he'd never curse God. He'd never say, I'm mad at God. Have you ever said, I'm mad at God? Oh, you're wrong. You need to repent of that. You, you're, you're wrong. I don't care what has happened to you in your life. I don't care whether your children have been bad or your husband has left you or your wife is has, has committed adultery with some other man. I don't know what bad thing has happened to you, but God didn't do it, and don't blame God. Don't make that mistake. Don't create an evil God in your mind. God is good. And this book, Feast of the Beast, I've written because I want the Jews to know that they believe in a lie. They believe in Leviathan and from the book of Job. They believe he's their angel of help, their medicant, their, their, their great helper, their guide through life. He is going to be their Messiah. He will possess the man that they call their king, their Messiah. They will rule the world, they say. And they will, there will be a great day of purification in which the Gentiles will be punished and all the Gentiles will be given a choice. Either you will worship Leviathan too, the serpent, and you will become a, 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 a Jew spiritually or you will die. They're going to behead you. They're going to behead you. Now we're seeing a lot of people being beheaded by the Muslims. Oh, that's devilish too. I've often said the Judaic religion and the Islamic religion are just the same. They both worship Satan. Satan has two versions. He's given each one. And they're two scorpions in a bottle. 
Don't put two scorpions together in a bottle. They'll battle it out. They'll kill each other because they're evil. There's no honor among thieves. I hope you will get this book. You'll you'll understand Judaism. I mean, for the first time, you'll say, wow, now I understand all about the Jews. I know what they worship. I know what they think is going to happen to me, a Gentile. I know what God has in store for them. Oh, yes, God's got it all worked out. God, <laughs> I start off this book telling you the end. That's appropriate, isn't it? Yeah, I start off Feast of the Beast uh, <laughs> with Revelation 20, verse 9. Here it is, my friends. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. That's those who rule the world for a short while. That's the evil. Those are the worshipers of Leviathan, the serpent. Oh, they're going to have their day. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's the destiny of the Jews. You who worship Judaism, listen to me very carefully. I don't hate you. I pity you. I pity you because you have fallen into a great tragedy, a great, great horror. You worship the devil. You worship not Jesus Christ who could save you from eternal punishment, but you worship Leviathan, Leviathan. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That is your destiny. It's written. It's determined. It's in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 9. It will happen. Don't be one of them. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be a Gentile. Listen to me. L listen to me. You can be a Christian. And then you don't have a race, you see. You say, well, wait just a minute. I, I, I like being German. I like being Mexican. I like being, okay, okay, that's fine for worth. You can be proud of it. I think you should be. If you're a black man, okay, be proud of it. <laughs> but remember, it's just for a short while. It's, I mean, it's just not that important. But knowing Jesus Christ is all important. It's everything. If you're a Jew, good for you. But you better have Jesus in your heart. <laughs> oh, yes. And then you can be one with him and with me and with every other Christian. And I know some of you have, have read the text Mars that said the Jews can't go to heaven. But I never said that. <laughs> oh. Uh, some people say the most amazing things. I was listening to TV last night on YouTube, and there was a gentleman on preaching from some, I don't know, Covenant Baptist Church or something, and he said that I was teaching that that uh, Esther in the Bible, that, that should never have been in the Bible, Esther in the Bible. Uh, and, and he was quoting from, you know, uh, the sermon that I did on Esther. But he didn't, he, he, he must have quoted just parts of it. Because I said Esther should be in the Bible. Esther is there for you and I to study it and to know it. God put Esther in the Bible, and no man can take it out. It's part of the Bible. God put every one of 66 books in the King James Bible. You can't take those out. They're there. They're there for instruction, <laughs> for righteousness. <laughs> oh, my. I'd like to take out Revelation. I don't like the things that are going to happen there. I don't want them to happen to people. I'd like, I'd like to just strike it out of the, I'd like to take my scissors and cut that out, but I can't because God put it in and these things are determined by Him and I can't change Him and I don't want to change Him because He knows what's right and I don't know because I'm just a man and He is God and He knows everything. He knows what should be in that book. Esther should be in the Bible pastor of the New Covenant Church, wherever you're from. <laughs> Seemed like a pretty nice guy, actually, but he, he sure got me wrong. 
Oh, he was just getting all fired up there saying, I, uh, you know, I, um, I, <laughs> I didn't believe Esther should even be in the Bible. I think I quoted others. I said, you know, there, there are experts who say Esther is really not a part of the Bible. But they, I, I mean, they're all experts saying all kinds of things. But I would quickly say, yes, it should, though, because it's there. If it's there, God put it there, and it should be there, and it's there for our instruction. And I read it. I got instructed by it. So there. The pastor, I love you, but you just don't know what. <laughs> he admitted that he really didn't know what I taught. He hadn't really studied me, but he, he heard that I <laughs> preached a sermon on Esther. <laughs> well, uh, keep keep studying, pastor. You'll find out about Tex Mars. <laughs> but I have many people that believe those wrongful things about me. I don't care. I don't really care. I'm not mad at them. I'm not mad at anybody. But I do want everyone to know the truth. This book is the truth. Feast of the Beast. Leviathan. He has another name, by the way. In Revelation 9, verse, well, 9 through 11, really. He's there. He's in the book of Revelation. He's in the book of Job. In the book of Job, he's called Leviathan. In the book of Revelation, he's called Abaddon. Abaddon. That means, in Hebrew, the destroyer. They're going to have a feast to him. You, you'll want to read about it. We're not going to have time to talk about it on this program, but listen, there's, I, I, I'm talking here about the, the feast of the beast. You know, we have the, symbolically, the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, my mother was a wonderful Christian lady. She had a, a picture on the wall of people sitting around this wonderful table, and there was Jesus at the end of it. It was a little bit like the, you know, that, that, that the, the painting by Da Vinci, uh, of The Last Supper. But here it was just of, of everyday people, and, the, and, and, and the, the, the table was prepared so elegantly. Everything was just perfect. And all the utensils were there. Oh, they were silver and gold, and oh my goodness gracious. And she said, someday, my mother said, someday, I'm going to be up there, that marriage supper of the Lamb. I was kidding her. I said, what are you going to eat? What are you going to order? She said, whatever I want. <laughs> They're going to have on the menu whatever I want. You see, it's symbolic. But you'll get your fill there, believe me. You'll, you'll be guest of honor. Everybody will be. But the Jews have their feast too. They have a great feast. And they consume not what they want, but they consume the serpent. Oh, my goodness. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The Feast of the Beast when we return. But now I want to tell you about this book. It's only $15. For $15, add $5 shipping and handling. A total of $20. Ask for the book, Feast of the Beast. By me, Tex Mars. How can you get it? Well, just phone us toll free, 1-800-234-9673, 1-800-234-9673. Or you can write to us at Power of Prophecy or to Tex Mars, 1708 Patterson Road, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road. We've been here so long. I tell you, they keep building houses around us. Got a, uh, the, the street was practically empty when we came out here out in the country, but now... You know, Austin has become a huge city. Beautiful out here. We're at the very end of the road. <laughs> the end of the road. <laughs> 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Now you can go to our website, powerofprophecy.com or texmars.com. And, and uh, uh, there's an ad for this book. And you can use your charge card and order it. You can read about it there. It starts off this way in that ad. It says the day of purification is when Gentiles will be forced to choose either be slaves or be dead. That's the ad, and that's the truth. I quote the rabbis, by the way. You know, it's the rabbis. They believe in, in, in the teachings of the rabbis. They, <laughs> Of course, they believe that they're like gods, little gods. They'll find out. Now let's return to our regular program. 
We're talking about the Feast of the Beast, my newest book. And I, I don't, only 100 pages, but it could be the most important book I've ever written. I'm working on a new book now. It's quite an interesting book, but this is, I, I have one more book. I've already finished it uh, about the Jews. And I'm not going to tell you the title of it or anything, but I'm going to, I'm going to save it. It's probably going to be out about next year. I'm, I'm just going to save that book. It's a special book about the Jews. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to leave you in suspense, folks, but it's, it's, Wow, it's it's. Mm. But this book is very unique. This is the first book. It's written for Jews and Gentiles. You need it if you're a Gentile. Of course, you definitely need it if you're a Jew. You'll learn who the Messiah will be of the Jews. You know, the Jews say we're waiting for a Messiah to come, not Jesus. No, they don't believe in Jesus Christ. They've rejected him, but they believe in another Messiah. Uh, what is his name then? Jesus said, I come in the Father's name, but you receive me not. Someday, one will come in his own name, and him you'll receive. That's what he told the Jews. You'll receive him. And this Messiah is called Leviathan. He's in their book, he's on their tree of life. In the Kabbalah, you'll see the tree of life, and you'll see the serpent stretched around. The tree of life all the way from the bottom to the top. Ah, yes. His head is at the top. Because they say the serpent affects them. The serpent is their God. He's their Messiah. And he will anoint a man as king. And then he will have a great day of purification in which all the Gentiles will be forced to choose. You know, Jesus said someday that would happen, didn't he? Revelation 13. Everyone will receive a mark in their forehead or their right hand. All who worship the beast will receive a mark. No doubt you, that, that's the mark of the beast. That's the mark of Leviathan. That's the mark of Abaddon. Wow. Don't take the mark. The Bible says if you take the mark, you're lost forever. Many people have asked me about the mark, and I say, well, have you ever studied the Jewish symbol of the six-pointed star? Have you ever noticed that it has six triangles on the six-pointed star? Have you ever noticed that it's a, there's a hexagram with six lines? Have you ever noticed that it's got six points? Six, six, six. That's the coded number of the Jewish star of David. But it's not the star of David. Because David in the Old Testament says, my shield is the word of God. Oh, that's, that's his shield. That's, that's his sim, that's his protection. But the Jews said we need something to protect us from evil spirits, from demons and so forth, and from our enemies. So the Rothschilds back in the Middle Ages developed this star of David, they called it. But it's not of David, not at all. It's the ancient star. Read Acts chapter 6. I'm not going to tell you anymore because you'll have to read Acts for yourself. Stephen talked about it. He talked about the God they worship, whom this star represents. He said, you had for your God the star. You had the star. That's what he told them. Boy, you know, the Bible tells us amazing things. It even says that Solomon, when he, when he betrayed God and worshiped Milcom and the, the, basically the devils and the mother goddess and so forth, that, that, that he required of the kings, uh, excuse me, of, of the priests, that is, of, of Israel, that they give him a tribute every year. And how much would that tribute be in gold? 666 pieces. Of gold. Oh yes, 666. It's coded in the Bible. It tells you. And the star is found in Acts 6. And in Amos the star is there. And also, you'll sit on the flag of Israel. The flag of modern day physical Israel. Now Israel was supposed to be abandoned by God. And it was. 
Jesus said in Matthew, he said that I'm taking away the kingdom of God from you. That's what he said. I'm taking the kingdom. He said the kingdom of God is taken from you. Let me clarify that. Is taken from you. You know, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, he said to the Jews, ye serpents. Oh, right there. You see it? Jesus said it. Ye serpents, ye generation, that's race of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? That's just blunt, isn't it? That's right to the point. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Now, let me read that again. How can one group of people, the house of Israel, Yes, they're serpents. Yes, they're, they're, they're a race of vipers. And yeah, it's true they cannot escape the damnation of hell. But how, how could they be responsible for all of the righteous blood shed upon the whole earth? From the blood of righteous Abel all the way back to Abel, Cain slew him. You say, wait just a minute. Was Cain a Jew? Was, was Cain of the house of Israel? What, what, listen. You must understand the spiritual, the spiritual methodology of Jesus Christ. You see, if you sin and you have no, no way to cover it up, you don't have the, no redemption, you don't, you don't accept Jesus Christ, he could cover it up for you. It says that Jesus forgives a multitude of sins. But if you don't have that, if you're on your own, so to speak, you say, I'll do whatever I want to do. Then you, you presume to be God. Well, in that case, you're responsible for all, for breaking all the laws. If you break one of them, you've broken every law there is. You say, that's not fair. I don't care. I'm just telling you what God said. If, 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 if you believe in the law and, and, and God says that, that Jesus will forgive your sins, but the law will, will be, you, you can never be forgiven by the law because the law is the law and, and you must receive punishment. You must receive punishment for breaking the law and you're guilty of all the laws that are broken. They throw you in with the lawbreakers. What are you here for? Well, I did such and such. No, you, you don't. <laughs> I read Solzhenitsyn in his book, Gulag Archipelago. Was, was put in prison for, I think it was 10 years in the gulag. And there he was in that dank, dirty, rotten, horrible prison. One man came in and they said, how many years did you get? He said, 20. They said, what did you do? He said, nothing. He said, nothing. <laughs> One guy laughed at him. And said, you must have done something. Said, <laughs> for nothing, they give you 10 years. <laughs> if you do nothing wrong, they give you 10 years, but you've got 20. <laughs> you must have done something wrong. <laughs> oh, my. Verse 35 of Matthew 23 says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Generation there is a, is a word that in, in the days of King James meant race. It's race. Look it up in your lexicons. Look it up in your strongs. Uh, a book uh, of words for the Bible. All these things shall come upon this race of people, the Jews, the house of Israel. Verse 38, Jesus told him, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. 
For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Jesus said, I, I, I've taken the kingdom away from you. And he says, your house is left, the house of Israel is left unto you desolate. And now these men go around about all of them, Baptists, uh, Pentecostals, and so forth. And they say, Israel has been restored. Israel has become a nation again in 1948. Oh, I love Israel. Oh, I'm a Zionist. You're a devil. You know why? God left the house of Israel desolate. It's right here, verse 38, chapter 23 of Matthew. And you, you think you can put it back together again? You can restore the house of Israel? You think you can do it? God says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And he says, until you see me coming again. When Jesus comes again, they'll see him and they'll know. Until then, their house is desolate. You cannot bless Israel. Israel is a heathen, devil nation worshiping the serpent. That's why they worship the beast. That's why they have the feast of the beast. That's why it's all planned. The day of purification, as they call it. Revelation 13 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Israel is born again. Israel became a nation again. Israel has, has plundered the, the Palestinians and taken away all their lands. And they're still building settlements, and they'll continue to do so. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That's why the Jews are powerful. That's why America and Britain and other nations must give them their 400 nuclear bombs and their missiles and their submarines and make of them a great power. Even though they're a small nation, we empower them. We're told by the devil to do so, by the dragon. Israel was wounded, was it not? In 70 A.D. by Titus, he went in and he destroyed Israel. And, and, and God said, that your house is left unto you desolate, and it was left desolate, and it still is desolate spiritually. But they have power. I, I think even President Donald Trump has to obey Israel and do what the Jews tell him to do. His own daughter became a Jew. She has three children, and they're Jews. His own daughter, Ivanka, and she's married to young Jared. And he's he sits at the right side. In all of these conferences of the President of the United States, oh, the Jews have us as their protector, as their benefactor. We represent the beast, and they're going to have the feast of the beast. I promise you it will happen. You say they can't. They're only a small nation. Oh, yes, but they've got the big ones, don't they? <laughs> On their side, it's going to happen. I hope you'll order and read the feast of the beast. And until next week, my friends, this is Tex Mars. I'm inviting you to tune in each week during this same time. Tune in and discover the power of prophecy.